This is Audible. The Word is Murder by Anthony Horowitz. Read by Rory Kinnear. 1. Funeral Plans Just after eleven o'clock on a bright spring morning, the sort of day when the sunshine is almost white and promises a warmth that it doesn't quite deliver, Diana Cooper crossed the Fulham Road and went into a funeral parlour. She was a short, very businesslike woman. There was a sense of determination in her eyes, her sharply cut hair, the very way she walked. If you saw her coming, your first instinct would be to step aside and let her pass, and yet there was nothing unkind about her. She was in her sixties with a pleasant, round face. She was expensively dressed, her pale raincoat hanging open to reveal a pink jersey and grey skirt. She wore a heavy bead and stone necklace, which might or might not have been expensive, and a number of diamond rings that most certainly were. There were plenty of women like her in the streets of Fulham and South Kensington. She might have been on her way to lunch or to an art gallery. The funeral parlour was called Cornwallis and Sons. It stood at the end of a terrace, with the name painted in a classical font both on the front of the building and down the side, so that you would notice it from whichever direction you were coming. The two inscriptions were prevented from meeting in the middle by a Victorian clock which was mounted above the front door and which had come to a stop, perhaps appropriately, at 11.59, one minute to midnight. Beneath the name, again printed twice, was the legend, Independent Funeral Directors, a family business since 1820. There were three windows looking out over the street, two of them curtained, the third empty but for an open book made of marble, engraved with a quotation. When sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions. All the wood, the window frames, the frontage, the main door, was painted a dark blue, nudging black. As Mrs. Cooper opened the door, a bell on an old-fashioned spring mechanism sounded loudly, once. She found herself in a small reception area with two sofas, a low table, and a few shelves with books that had that peculiar sense of sadness that comes with being unread. A staircase led up to the other floors. A narrow corridor stretched ahead. Almost at once, a woman appeared, stout with thick legs and heavy black leather shoes coming down the stairs. She was smiling pleasantly, politely. The smile acknowledged that this was a delicate, painful business, but that it would be expedited with calm and efficiency. Her name was Irene Laws. She was the personal assistant to Robert Cornwallis, the funeral director, and also acted as his receptionist. "'Good morning. Can I help you?' she asked. "'Yes, I would like to arrange a funeral. "'Are you here on behalf of someone who's died recently?' The word died was instructive. Not passed away, not deceased. She had made it her business practice to speak plainly, recognising that, at the end of the day, it was less painful for all concerned. "'No,' Mrs. Cooper replied. "'It's for myself.' I see. Irene Laws didn't blink. And why should she? It was not at all uncommon for people to arrange their own funerals. Do you have an appointment? she asked. No, I didn't know I'd need one. I'll see if Mr. Cornwallis is free. Please take a seat. Would you like a cup of tea or coffee? No, thank you. Diana Cooper sat down. Irene Laws disappeared down the corridor, reappearing a few minutes later behind a man who so exactly suited the image of the funeral director that he could have been playing the part. There was, of course, the obligatory dark suit and sombre tie, but the very way he stood seemed to suggest that he was apologising for having to be there. His hands were clasped together in a gesture of profound regret. His face was crumpled, mournful, not helped by hair that had thinned to the edge of baldness and a beard that had the look of a failed experiment. He wore tinted spectacles that were sinking into the bridge of his nose, not just framing his eyes, but masking them. He was about forty years old. He, too, was smiling. "'Good morning,' he said. "'My name is Robert Cornwallis. I understand you wish to discuss a funeral plan with us.' "'Yes.' "'You've been offered coffee or tea? Please come this way.' The new client was taken down the corridor to a room at the end. This was as understated as the reception area, with one difference. Instead of books, there were folders and brochures which, if opened, would show images of coffins, hearses, traditional or horse-drawn, and price lists. 
A number of urns had been arranged on two shelves should the discussion veer towards cremation. Two armchairs faced each other, one beside a small desk. Cornwallis sat here. He took out a pen, a silver Mont Blanc, and rested it on a notepad. The funeral is your own, he began. Yes. Suddenly Mrs. Cooper was brisk, wanting to get straight to the point. I have already given some consideration to the details. I take it you have no problem with that? On the contrary, individual requirements are important to us. These days, pre-planned funerals and what you might call bespoke or themed funerals are very much the mainstay of our business. It is our privilege to provide exactly what our clients demand. After our discussion here, and assuming our terms are acceptable to you, we will provide you with a full invoice and breakdown of what has been agreed. Your relatives and friends will have nothing to do except, of course, to attend. And from our experience, I can assure you that it will give them great comfort to know that everything has been done exactly in accordance with your wishes. Mrs. Cooper nodded. Excellent. Well, let's get down to it, shall we? She took a breath, then dived straight in. I want to be buried in a cardboard coffin. Cornwallis was about to make his first note. He paused, the nib hovering over the page. If you are considering an eco-funeral, might I suggest recycled wood or even twisted willow branches rather than cardboard? There are occasions when cardboard can be not entirely effective. He chose his words carefully, allowing all sorts of possibilities to hang in the air. Willow is hardly more expensive and a great deal more attractive. All right. I want to be buried in Brompton Cemetery, next to my husband. You lost him recently? Twelve years ago. We already have the plot, so there'll be no problems there. And this is what I want in the service. She opened her handbag and took out a sheet of paper, which she laid on the desk. The funeral director glanced down. I see that you have already put a great deal of thought into the matter, he said. And this is a very well-considered service, if I may say so. Partly religious, partly humanist. Well, there's a psalm and there's the Beatles. A poem, a bit of classical music and a couple of addresses. I don't want the thing going on too long. We can work out the timings exactly. Diana Cooper had planned her funeral, and she was going to need it. She was murdered about six hours later that same day. At the time of her death, I had never heard of her, and I knew almost nothing about how she was killed. I may have noticed the headline in the newspapers, Actor's Mother Murdered, but the photographs and the bulk of the story were all focused on the more famous son, who had just been cast as the lead in a new American television series. The conversation that I have described is only a rough approximation because, of course, I wasn't there. But I did visit Cornwallis and Sons and spoke at length to both Robert Cornwallis and his assistant, she was also his cousin, Irene Laws. If you were to walk down the Fulham Road, you would have no trouble identifying the funeral parlour. The rooms are exactly as I described them. Most of the other details are taken from witness statements and police reports. We know when Mrs. Cooper entered the funeral parlour because her movements were recorded on CCTV both in the street and on the bus that took her from her home that morning. It was one of her eccentricities that she always used public transport. She could easily have afforded a chauffeur. She left the funeral parlour at a quarter to twelve, walked up to South Kensington Tube Station and took the Piccadilly line to Green Park. She had an early lunch with a friend at the Café Murano, an expensive restaurant on St. James's Street near Fortnum and Mason. From there, she took a taxi to the Globe Theatre on the South Bank. She wasn't seeing a play. She was on the board, and there was a meeting on the first floor of the building that lasted from two o'clock until a little before five. She got home at five past six. It had just begun to rain, but she had an umbrella with her and left it in a faux Victorian stand beside the front door. Thirty minutes later, somebody strangled her. She lived in a smart, terraced house in Britannia Road, just beyond the area of Chelsea that is known, appropriately in her case, as World's End. There were no CCTV cameras in the street, so there was no way of knowing who went in or left around the time of the murder. The neighbouring houses were empty. One was owned by a consortium based in Dubai and was usually rented out, though not at this particular time. The other belonged to a retired lawyer and his wife, but they were away in the south of France, so nobody heard anything. She was not found for two days. Andrea Kluvanek, 
The Slovakian cleaner who worked for her twice a week made the discovery when she came in on Wednesday morning. Diana Cooper was lying face down on the living room floor. A length of red cord, normally used to tie back the curtains, was around her throat. The forensic report, written in the matter-of-fact, almost disinterested manner of all such documents, described in detail the blunt force injuries of the neck, the fractured hyoid bone and conjunctiva of the eyes. Andrea saw something a great deal worse. She had been working at the house for two years and had come to like her employer, who had always treated her kindly, often stopping to have a coffee with her. On the Wednesday, as she opened the door, she was confronted with a dead body and one that had been lying there for some time. The face, what she could see of it, had gone mauve. The eyes were empty and staring, the tongue hanging out grotesquely, twice its normal length. One arm was outstretched, a finger with a diamond ring pointing at her as if in accusation. The central heating had been on. The body was already beginning to smell. According to her testimony, Andrea did not scream. She was not sick. She quietly backed out of the house and called the police on her mobile phone. She did not go in again until they arrived. To begin with, the police assumed that Diana Cooper had been the victim of a burglary. Certain items, including jewellery and a laptop computer, had been taken from the house. Many of the rooms had been searched, the contents scattered. However, there had been no break-in. Mrs. Cooper had clearly opened the door to her attacker, although it was unclear if she had known the person or not. She had been surprised and strangled from behind. She had barely put up a fight. There were no fingerprints, no DNA, no clues of any sort, suggesting that the perpetrator must have planned this with a great deal of care. He had distracted her and plucked the red cord off the hook beside the velvet curtain in the living room. He had crept up behind her, slipped it over her head, and pulled. It would have taken only a minute or so for her to die. But then the police found out about her visit to Cornwallis and Sons and realised that they had a real puzzle on their hands. Think about it. Nobody arranges their own funeral and then gets killed on the same day. This was no coincidence. The two events had to be connected. Had she somehow known she was going to die? Had someone seen her going in or coming out of the funeral parlour and been prompted for some reason to take action? Who actually knew she had been there? It was definitely a mystery, and one that required a specialist approach. At the same time, it had absolutely nothing to do with me. That was about to change. 2. Hawthorne It's easy for me to remember the evening that Diana Cooper was killed. I was celebrating with my wife, dinner at Morrow in Exmouth Market, and quite a lot to drink. That afternoon, I had pressed the send button on my computer, emailing my new novel to the publishers, putting eight months' work behind me. The House of Silk was a Sherlock Holmes sequel that I had never expected to write. I had been approached, quite out of the blue, by the Conan Doyle estate, who had decided, for the first time, to lend their name and their authority to a new adventure. I leapt at the opportunity. I had first read the Sherlock Holmes stories when I was seventeen, and they had stayed with me all my life. It wasn't just the character I loved, although Holmes is unquestionably the father of all modern detectives. Nor was it the mysteries, as memorable as they are. Mainly, I was drawn to the world that Holmes and Watson inhabited. The Thames, the growlers rattling over the cobblestones, the gas lamps, the swirling London fog. It was as if I'd been invited to move into 221B Baker Street and become a quiet witness to the greatest friendship in literature. How could I refuse? It struck me from the very start that my job was to be invisible. I tried to hide myself in Doyle's shadow, to imitate his literary tropes and mannerisms, but never, as it were, to intrude. I wrote nothing that he might not have written himself. I mention this only because it worries me to be so very prominent in these pages. But this time round, I have no choice. I'm writing exactly what happened. For once, I wasn't working on any television. Foyle's War, my wartime detective series, was no longer in production, and there was a question mark over its return. I'd written more than twenty two-hour episodes over a sixteen-year period, almost three times longer than the war itself. I was tired. Worse still, 
Having finally reached 15th of August 1945, VJ Day, I had run out of war. I wasn't quite sure what to do next. One of the actors had suggested Foyle's piece. I didn't think it would work. I was also between novels. At this time, I was known mainly as a children's author, although I secretly hoped The House of Silk would change that. In 2000, I'd published the first in a series of adventures about a teenage spy called Alex Ryder, which had sold all over the world. I loved writing children's books, but I was worried that with every year that passed, I was getting further and further away from my audience. i just turned 55. It was time to move on. As it happened, I was about to travel to the Hay on Wye Literary Festival to talk about Scorpio Rising, the tenth and supposedly last book in the series. Perhaps the most exciting project on my desk was the first draft of a film screenplay, Tin Tin 2. To my amazement, I had been hired by Steven Spielberg, who was currently reading it. The film was going to be directed by Peter Jackson. It was quite hard to get my head around the fact that suddenly I was working with the two biggest directors in the world. I wasn't sure how it had happened. I'll admit that I was nervous. I had read the script perhaps a dozen times, and was doing my best to convince myself it was moving in the right direction. Were the characters working? Were the action sequences strong enough? Jackson and Spielberg happened to be in London together in a week's time, and I was going to meet them and get their notes. So when my mobile rang and I didn't recognise the number, I wondered if it might be one of them. Not, of course, that they would call me personally. An assistant would check it was me and then pass me across. It was about ten o'clock in the morning, and I was sitting in my office on the top floor of my flat reading The Meaning of Treason by Rebecca West, a classic study of life in Britain after the Second World War. I was beginning to think that this might be the right direction for Foyle. Cold War. I would throw him into the world of spies, traitors, communists, atomic scientists. I closed the book and picked up my mobile. Tony? A voice asked. It certainly wasn't Spielberg. Very few people call me Tony. To be honest, I don't like it. I've always been Anthony, or, to some of my friends, Ant. Yes? I said. How are you doing, mate? This is Hawthorne. In fact, I'd known who he was before he'd spoken his name. There could be no mistaking those flat vowels, that strangely misplaced accent, part Cockney, part Northern, or the word mate. Mr. Hawthorne, I said. He had been introduced to me as Daniel, but from the very first I'd felt uncomfortable using his first name. He never used it himself. In fact, I never heard anyone else use it either. It's nice to hear from you. Yeah, yeah. He sounded impatient. Look, you've got a minute. I'm sorry, what's this about? I was wondering if we could meet. What are you doing this afternoon? That, incidentally, was typical of him. He had a sort of myopia whereby the world would arrange itself to his vision of how things should be. He wasn't asking if I could meet him tomorrow or next week. It had to be immediately according to his needs. As I've explained, I wasn't doing anything very much that afternoon, but I wasn't going to tell him that. Well, I'm not sure, I began. How about three o'clock at that cafe where we used to go? J&A? That's the one. There's something I need to ask you. I really would appreciate it. J&A was in Clerkenwell, a ten-minute walk from where I lived. If he had wanted me to cross London, I might have hesitated, but the truth is I was intrigued. OK, I said. Three o'clock. That's great, mate. I'll see you there. He rang off. The Tintin script was still on the computer screen in front of me. I closed it down and thought about Hawthorne. I'd first met him the year before when I was working on a five-part television series which was due to be screened in a few months' time. It was called Injustice, a legal drama starring James Purefoy. Injustice was inspired by one of those perennial questions screenwriters sometimes ask themselves when they're casting around for a new idea. How can a barrister defend someone when they know they're guilty? The short answer, incidentally, is that they can't. If the client confesses to the crime before the trial, the barrister will refuse to represent him. There has to be at least a presumption of innocence. So I came up with a story about an animal rights activist who gleefully confesses to the murder of a child shortly after his barrister, William Travers, Purefoy, has managed to get him acquitted. 
As a result, Travers suffers a nervous breakdown and moves to Suffolk. Then, one day, waiting for a train at Ipswich Station, he happens to see the activist again. A few days later, the activist is himself killed, and the question is, was Travers responsible? The story boiled down to a duel between the barrister and the detective inspector who was investigating him. Travers was a dark character, damaged and quite possibly dangerous, but he was still the hero, and the audience had to root for him. So I deliberately set out to create a detective who would be as unpleasant as possible. The audience would find him menacing, borderline racist, chippy and aggressive. I based him on Hawthorne. To be fair, Hawthorne was none of those things. Well, he wasn't racist, anyway. He was, however, extremely annoying, to the extent that I used to dread my meetings with him. He and I were complete opposites. I just couldn't make out where he was coming from. He had been found for me by the production supervisor working on the series. I was told that he'd been a detective inspector with the Metropolitan Police Service in London, working out of the sub-command in Putney. He was a murder specialist with ten years on the force, which had come to an abrupt end when he'd been kicked out for reasons that weren't made clear. There are a surprising number of ex-policemen helping production companies make police dramas. They provide the little details that make the story ring true, and, to be fair, Hawthorne was very good at the job. He had an instinctive understanding of what I needed and what would work on screen. I remember one example. In an early scene when my fictitious detective is examining a weak old corpse, the crime scene examiner hands him a tub of Vicks vapour rub to smear under his nose. The mentholatum covers the smell. It was Hawthorne who told me that, and if you watch the scene, you'll see how that moment somehow makes it come alive. The first time I saw him was at the production office of Eleventh Hour Films, which was the company making the series. Once we got started, I'd be able to contact him at any time of the day to throw questions at him, and would then weave the answers into the script. All of this could be done over the telephone. This meeting was really just a formality to introduce us. When I arrived, he was already sitting in the reception area with one leg crossed over the other and his coat folded over his lap. I knew at once that he was the person I'd come to meet. He wasn't a large man. He didn't look particularly threatening. But even that single movement, the way he got to his feet, gave me pause for thought. He had the same silken quality as a panther or a leopard, and there was a strange malevolence in his eyes. There were a soft brown that seemed to challenge, even to threaten me. He was about forty years old, with hair of an indeterminate colour that was cut very short around the ears and was just beginning to turn grey. He was clean-shaven. His skin was pale. I got the feeling that he might have been very handsome as a child, but something had happened to him at some time in his life so that, although he still wasn't ugly, he was curiously unattractive. It was as if he had become a bad photograph of himself. He was smartly dressed in a suit, white shirt and tie, the raincoat now held over his arm. He looked at me with almost exaggerated interest, as if I had somehow surprised him. Even as I came in, I got the feeling that he was emptying me out. Hello, Anthony, he said. Nice to meet you. How did he even know who I was? There were lots of people coming in and out of the office, and nobody had announced me, nor had I told him my name. I'm a great admirer of your work, he said in a way that told me he'd never read anything I'd written, and that actually he didn't care if I knew it. Thank you, I said. I've been hearing about this program you want to make. Sounds really interesting. Was he deliberately being sarcastic? He managed to look bored, even as he spoke the words. I smiled. I'm looking forward to working with you. It'll be fun, he said. But it never was. We spoke on the phone quite often, but we also had about half a dozen meetings, mainly at the office or in the courtyard outside J&A. He smoked all the time, sometimes roll-ups, but if not, cheap brands like Lambert and Butler or Richmond. I had heard that Hawthorne lived in Essex, but I had no idea where. He never talked about himself or his time in the police force, and certainly not how it had ended. The production supervisor who had contacted him in the first place told me that he had worked on a number of high-profile murder investigations and had quite a reputation, but I couldn't find anything about him on Google. He clearly had a remarkable mind. Although he made it clear that he was no writer himself and showed no interest at all in the series that I was trying to create, he always came up with exactly the right scenarios before I even asked for them. 
There's another example of his work in the opening scenes. William Travers is defending a black kid who has been framed by the police for the theft of a medal, which, they claim, they found in the boy's jacket. But the medal had recently been cleaned, and when the boy's pockets are examined, there are no traces of sulfamic acid or ammonia, the most common ingredients in silver polish, proving that it couldn't have been there. All of that was his idea. I can't deny that he helped me, and yet I slightly dreaded meeting him. He always got straight down to business with almost no small talk. You'd have thought he would have an opinion about something, the weather, the government, the earthquake in Fukushima, the marriage of Prince William, but he never talked about anything except the matter in hand. He drank coffee, black two sugars, and he smoked but never ate when he was with me, not so much as a biscuit, and he always wore exactly the same clothes. Quite honestly, I could have been looking at the same photograph of him every time he came in. He was as unchanging as that. And yet here's the funny thing. He seemed to know an awful lot about me. I'd been out drinking the night before. My assistant was ill. I'd spent the whole weekend writing. I didn't need to tell him these things. He told me. I used to wonder if he'd been talking to someone in the office, but the information he came up with was completely random and seemed spontaneous. I never quite worked him out. The biggest mistake I made was to show him the second draft of the script. I usually write about a dozen drafts before an episode is filmed. I get notes from the producer, from the broadcaster, ITV in this case, from my agent, and later on from the director and the star. It's a collaborative process, although one that can sometimes leave me overwhelmed. Won't the bloody thing ever be right? But it works so long as I feel that the project is moving forward, that each draft is better than the one before. There has to be a certain amount of give and take, and there's some comfort in the fact that, at the end of the day, everyone involved is trying to make the script more effective. Hawthorne didn't understand this. He was like a brick wall, and once he decided that something was wrong, nothing was going to get past him. There was a scene I'd written where my detective meets his senior officer, a chief superintendent. This is shortly after the dead body of the animal rights activist has been found in a remote farmhouse. The CS invites him to sit down, and the detective replies, I'll stand if you don't mind, sir. It was a tiny point. I was just trying to show that my character was a man who had problems with authority. But Hawthorne wouldn't have any of it. That wouldn't happen, he said flatly. We were sitting outside a Starbucks, I forget exactly where, with the script on a table between us. As usual, he was wearing a suit and tie. He was smoking his last cigarette, using the empty packet as an ashtray. Why not? Because if your governor tells you to sit down, you sit down. He does sit down. Yeah, but he argues about it first. What's the fucking point? He just makes himself look stupid. Hawthorne swore all the time, by the way. If I was going to replicate his language exactly, I'd be writing the F word every other line. I tried to explain. The actors will understand what I'm trying to get at, I said. It's just a detail. It introduces the scene, but it's a key to how the two men relate to each other. But it's not true, Tony. It's a load of cobblers. I tried to explain to him that there are many different sorts of truth, and that television truth might have very little connection with real life. I argued that our understanding of policemen, doctors, nurses, even criminals, is largely inspired by what we see on the screen, not the other way round. But Hawthorne had made up his mind. He had helped me with the script, but now that he was reading it, he didn't believe it, and so he didn't like it. We argued about everything, every scene which involved the police. All he saw was the paperwork, the uniforms, the angled poise lamps. He couldn't find his way to the story. I was quite relieved when all five scripts were written and handed in, and I no longer had to deal with him. When there were further queries, I got the production office to email him. We shot the series in Suffolk and in London. The part of the detective was played by a brilliant actor, Charlie Creed Miles, and the funny thing was that, physically, he was remarkably similar to Hawthorne. But it didn't end there. Hawthorne had got under my skin, and, quite deliberately, I'd put a lot of his darker side into the character. I'd also given him a very similar name, from Daniel to Mark, one biblical character to another, and Wenborn instead of Hawthorne. This is something I often do. When I killed him off at the end of episode four, it made me smile. I was curious to know what he wanted, but at the same time I had a vague sense of misgiving as I strolled down to the cafe that afternoon. 
Hawthorne did not belong to my world, and frankly, I had no need for him just then. On the other hand, I hadn't had lunch, and, as it happens, J and A served the best cakes in London. They're in a little alleyway just off the Clerkenwell Road, and because they're tucked away, they're usually not too busy. Hawthorne was waiting for me outside, sitting at a table with a coffee and a cigarette. He was wearing exactly the same clothes as the last time I'd seen him, the same suit, tie, and raincoat. He looked up as I arrived and nodded, which was about all I was going to get by way of a greeting. How's the program? He asked. You should have come to the cast and the crew screening. I said. We'd taken over a hotel in London and shown the first two episodes. Hawthorne had been invited. I was busy. He replied. A waitress came out and I ordered tea and a slice of Victoria sponge. I know I shouldn't eat stuff like that, but you try spending eight hours a day on your own. I used to smoke between chapters, but gave up thirty years ago. Cake's probably just as bad. How are you? I asked. He shrugged. Can't complain. He glanced at me. You've been in the country. As it happened, I'd got back from Suffolk that very morning. My wife and I had just been there for a couple of days. Yes, I said warily. And you got a new puppy. I looked at him curiously. This was absolutely typical of him. I hadn't told anyone that I'd been out of London. I certainly hadn't tweeted about it. As for the puppy, it belonged to our neighbours. We'd been looking after it while they were away. How do you know all that? I asked. It was just an educated guess. He waved my question aside. I was hoping you could help me. How? I want you to write about me. Every time I met him, Hawthorne had a way of surprising me. You know where you are with most people. You form a relationship. You get to know them, and after that, the rules are more or less set. But it was never like that with him. He had this strange mercurial quality. Just when I thought I knew where we were going, he would somehow prove me wrong. What do you mean? I asked. I want you to write a book about me. Why would I want to do that? For money. You want to pay me? No. I thought we'd go fifty-fifty. A couple of people came and sat down at the table next to us. I used the moment as they made their way past to work out what to say. I was nervous about turning Hawthorne down. That said, I already knew I'd known instantly that was exactly what I was going to do. I don't understand. I said, "What sort of book are you talking about?" Hawthorne gazed at me with those muddy choir boy eyes. Let me explain it to you," he said, as if it were perfectly obvious. "You know, I do a bit of work here and there for TV, that sort of stuff. You probably heard that I got kicked out of the Met. Well, that's their loss, and I don't want to go into all that. The thing is, I do a bit of consultancy too, for the police. It's unofficial. They use me when something unusual happens. Most cases are pretty straightforward, but sometimes they aren't. When something's outside their everyday experience." That's when they come to me. Seriously, I found it hard to believe. That's how it is with the modern police these days. They've made so many cutbacks. There's no one left to do the job. You've heard of Group Four and Circo? They're a bunch of tosses, but they're in and out all the time. They've sent in investigators that couldn't find their way out of a paper bag. And that's not all. We used to have a big laboratory down at Lambeth. We'd send down blood samples and stuff like that. But they sold it off, and now they use private companies. Takes twice as long and costs twice as much, but that doesn't seem to bother them. Same with me. I'm an external resource. He paused as if to be sure that I was following him. I nodded. He lit a cigarette and went on. I do well enough out of it. I get a daily rate plus expenses and all that. But the thing is, you see, and to be honest, I don't like to mention this. I'm a bit short. There just aren't enough people getting murdered. And when I met you on that TV show of yours, I know that you write books. I had this idea that actually we could help each other. Fifty-fifty. I get sent some really interesting stuff. You can write about me. But I hardly know you. I said. You'll get to know me. I've got a case on at the moment, as a matter of fact. It's early days, but I think it could be right up your street. The waitress arrived with my cake and tea, but now I wished I hadn't ordered them. I just wanted to get home. Why do you think anyone would want to read about you? I asked. 
I'm a detective. People like reading about detectives. But you're not a proper detective. You got fired. Why did you get fired, by the way? I don't want to talk about that. Well, if I was going to write about you, you'd have to tell me. I'd have to know where you live, whether you're married or not, what you have for breakfast, what you do on your day off. That's why people read murder stories. Is that what you think? Yes. He shook his head. I don't agree. The word is murder. That's what matters. Look, I'm really sorry. I tried to break it gently. It's a good idea, and I'm sure you've got a really interesting case. But I'm afraid I'm far too busy. <laughs> anyway, it's not what I do. I write about fictional detectives. I've just finished a story about Sherlock Holmes. I used to do Poirot and Midsummer Murders. I'm a fiction writer. You need someone who writes true crime. What's the difference? All the difference in the world. I'm in control of my stories. I like to know what I'm writing about. Creating the crimes and the clues and all the rest of it is half the fun. If I were to follow you around, just writing down what you saw and what you said, what would that make me? I'm sorry, I'm not interested. He glanced at me over the tip of his cigarette. He didn't look surprised or offended, as if he'd known that was what I was going to say. I reckon you could sell a ton of copies, he remarked. That'd be easy for you. I'll tell you everything you need to know. Don't you want to hear what I'm working on? I didn't, but he went on before I could stop him. A woman walks into a funeral parlour just the other side of London, in South Kensington. She's arranged her own funeral, right down to the last detail. And that same day, six hours later, someone murders her, goes into her house, and strangles her. It's a bit unusual, wouldn't you say? Who was she? I asked. Her name doesn't matter just for now, for she was rich. She's got a famous son. And here's another thing: as far as we can see, she didn't have an enemy in the world. Everybody liked her. That's why I got called in. None of it makes any sense. For a brief moment, I was tempted. The hardest part of writing murder stories is thinking up the plots, and at that particular moment, I didn't have any more in my head. After all, there are only so many reasons why anyone wants to kill someone else. You do it because you want something from them: their money, their wife, their job. You do it because you're afraid of them. They know something about you, and perhaps they're threatening you. You kill them out of revenge because of something they knowingly or unknowingly did to you, or I suppose you kill them by accident. After twenty-two episodes of Foyle's War, I pretty much covered every variation. And then there was the question of research. If I decide that the killer is going to be, say, a hotel chef, then I have to create his world. I have to visit the hotel. I have to understand the catering business. Making him believable means a lot of hard work, and he's only the first of twenty or thirty characters I have to invent. All of them lurking somewhere inside my head. I have to understand police procedure, fingerprints, forensic science, DNA, all the rest of it. It can be months before I write the first word. I was tired. I wasn't sure I had the stamina to begin another book so soon after finishing the House of Silk. Effectively, Hawthorne was offering me a shortcut. He was giving me the whole thing on a plate, and he was right. The case did sound interesting. A woman walks into a funeral parlour. It was actually quite a good opening. I could already see the first chapter: spring sunshine, a smart area of town. A woman crosses the road. It was still unthinkable. How did you know? I asked suddenly. What? Just now, you told me I'd been in the country, and you said I'd got a puppy. Who told you that? Nobody told me. Then how did you know? He scowled as if he didn't want to tell me, but at the same time he was trying to get something out of me, and so briefly I had the upper hand. There's sand stuck in the tread of your shoes, he said. I saw it when you crossed your leg. So either you've walked across a building site or you've been on the coast. I heard you got a place in Orford, so I suppose you must have been there. And the puppy? There's a paw print on your jeans just below the knee. I examined the material. Sure enough, it was there, so faint that I wouldn't have noticed it, but he had. Wait a minute, I said. How do you know it was a puppy? It could have been a breed of small dog. And for that matter, how do you know I didn't just meet it in the street? He looked at me sadly. Someone sat down and chewed your left shoelace. He said, "I don't suppose that was you." I didn't look. I have to admit, I was impressed. At the same time, 
I was annoyed that I hadn't worked it out for myself. I'm sorry, I said. It's certainly an interesting case from the sound of what you say, and I'm sure you could find a writer who would do it for you, but it's like I said. You need to ask a journalist or someone like that. Even if I wanted to do it, I can't. I'm working on other things. I wondered how he would respond. Again, he wrong-footed me. He just shrugged. Yeah, all right. It was just a thought. He got to his feet, his hand reaching towards his trouser pocket. Do you want me to get that? He meant the tea and cake. No, it's all right. I'll pay, I said. I had a coffee. I'll get that too. Well, if you change your mind, you know where to reach me. Yes, of course. I can talk to my literary agent, if you like. She might be able to recommend someone who can help. No, don't worry. I'll find someone. He turned round and walked away. I ate the cake. It was a shame to waste it. Then I went back home and spent the rest of the afternoon reading. I tried not to think about Hawthorne, but I couldn't get him out of my mind. When you're a full-time writer, one of the hardest things to do is to turn down work. You're slamming a door which may not open again, and there's always the fear of what you may have missed on the other side. Years ago, a producer rang me to ask if I might be interested in working on a musical based on the songs of a Swedish pop group. I turned her down, which is why I'm not on the posters and have enjoyed none of the royalties of Mamma Mia. I don't have any regrets, incidentally. There's no saying the show would have been such a success if I had ended up writing it. But it just shows the level of insecurity that most writers live with day by day. A bizarre crime that happened to be true. A woman walks into a funeral parlour. Hawthorne, an odd, complicated, but genuinely brilliant detective, gets called in as some sort of consultant. Had I made another mistake refusing his offer? I picked up my book and went back to work. Two days later, I was in Hayon Wai. It's funny how many literary festivals there are all over the world. There are some writers I know who never actually write anymore. They simply spend their time travelling from one shindig to the next. I've often wondered how I would have managed if I'd been born with a stammer or chronic shyness. The modern writer has to be able to perform, often to a huge audience. It's almost like being a stand-up comedian, except the questions never change and you always end up telling the same jokes. Whether it's crime in Harrogate, children's books in Bath, science fiction in Glasgow or poetry in Aldborough, it feels as if there's a literary festival in every city in the UK. And yet Hay, which takes place in a disturbingly muddy field on the edge of a tiny market town, has become one of the most preeminent. People come from miles around, and over the years speakers have included two U.S. presidents, several great train robbers, and J.K. Rowling. I was excited to be there, talking to about 500 children in a large tent. As usual, there was a scattering of adults, too. People who know my television writing will often come to my events and will happily sit through 40 minutes of Alex Ryder in order to talk about Foyle's war. The session had gone well. The children had been lively and had asked some good questions. I'd managed to get in some stuff about foil. I was almost exactly sixty minutes in and had received a signal to close things down when something rather strange happened. There was a woman sitting in the front row. At first I'd taken her for a teacher or perhaps a librarian. She was very ordinary-looking, about forty, round-faced with long, fair hair and glasses dangling from a chain around her neck. I'd noticed her because she seemed to be on her own and also because she didn't seem particularly interested in anything I had to say. She hadn't laughed at any of my jokes. I was afraid she might be a journalist. Newspapers often send reporters to author talks these days, and any joke you make, any unguarded comment, may be quoted out of context and used against you. So I was on my guard when she put up her hand, and one of the attendants handed her the roving mic. I was wondering, she said, why is it that you always write fantasy? Why don't you write anything real? Most of the questions that I've been asked at literary festivals, I've been asked many times before. Where do my ideas come from? Which are my favourite characters? How long does it take to write a book? Nobody had ever asked me this, and I was a little put out. Her tone wasn't offensive, but there was still something in what she'd asked that rankled. Foyle's war is real, I replied. Every episode is based on true stories. I was about to go on to explain how much research I did, that I had spent the whole of the last week reading about Alan Nunn May, 
who had shared atomic secrets with the Soviets, and who might be the inspiration for my next episode if a new series of foil went ahead. But she interrupted me. I'm sure you do use true stories, but what I'm trying to say is the crimes aren't real. And your other television shows, Poirot and Midsummer Murders, they're all completely fantastical. You write stories about a fourteen-year-old spy, and I know a lot of children enjoy them, but that's the same. I don't mean to be rude, but I wonder why you're not more interested in the real world. What is the real world? I countered. I just mean real people. Some of the children were getting restless. It was time to move on. I like writing fiction, I said. That's what I do. Aren't you worried that your books might be considered irrelevant? I don't think they have to be real to be relevant. I'm sorry, I do like your work, but I disagree. It was an odd coincidence, given the proposal Hawthorne had put to me just a couple of days before. I looked for the woman again before I left, but I didn't see her, and she didn't come to get a book signed. On the train back to London, I couldn't help thinking about what she had said. Was she right? Was my work too focused on fantasy? I was about to launch myself as an adult writer, but my first outing, The House of Silk, was about as far from the modern world as it was possible to be. Some of my television work, Injustice, for example, was set in a recognisable 21st century London, but perhaps it was true that I'd spent too long living in my own imagination, and that if I wasn't careful, I would lose touch. Maybe I already had. Maybe a crash course in reality would do me good. It's a long, long way from Hay on Wye to Paddington Station. By the time I got home, I had made up my mind. As soon as I got in, I picked up the phone. Hawthorne? Tony? All right. Fifty-fifty. I'm in. Three. Chapter One. Hawthorne did not like my first chapter. I'm jumping ahead here because I didn't actually show it to him until a while later, and even then it was only with reluctance. I remembered all too well what had happened with injustice, and would have preferred to keep it under wraps. But he insisted, and since this was meant to be an equal partnership, how could I refuse? But I think it's important to explain how the book was written, the rules of engagement, so to speak. These are my words, but they were his actions, and the truth is that, to begin with, the two didn't quite fit. The two of us were sitting in one of the many Starbucks that seemed to punctuate our investigation. I had emailed him the pages, and I knew I was in trouble when he took them out of his case, and I saw that he had printed them, covering them with red crosses and circles. I'm very protective of my writing. It's fair to say that I think about every single word I write. Do I need single? Would true be better than fair? When I had agreed to work with Hawthorne, I had assumed that although he was in charge of the case, he would take a back seat when it came to the actual narrative. He quickly disabused me. It's all wrong, Tony, Hawthorne began. You're leading people up the garden path. What do you mean? The very first sentence. It's wrong. I read what I had written. Just after eleven o'clock on a bright spring morning, the sort of day when the sunshine is almost white and promises a warmth that it doesn't quite deliver, Diana Cooper crossed the Fulham Road and went into a funeral parlour. I don't see what's wrong with that, I said. It was about eleven o'clock. She went into a funeral parlour. But not the way you say. She took the bus. She caught it at the top of her street. We know that because we got her on CCTV. The driver also remembered her and gave the police a statement. But here's the problem, mate. Eh? Why do you say she crossed the road? Why shouldn't I? Because she didn't. We're talking about the number 14 bus, which he picked up at Chelsea Village. That's the stop marked U, exactly opposite Britannia Road. It took her to Chelsea Football Club, Hortensia Road, Edith Grove, Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, Beaufort Street, and finally Old Church Street, stop HJ, where she got off. You have a terrific knowledge of London bus routes, I said, but I don't quite get the point. She didn't have to cross the road. When she left the bus... She was already on the right side. Does it really make any difference? Well, yes, it might. If you say she crossed the road, it means she must have gone somewhere else before she went into the undertaker's, and that might be important. She could have gone to the bank and taken out a load of money. 
She could have had a row with someone that very morning, and that could have been the reason she was killed. That same person could have followed her across the road and seen where she was going. She could have stopped in front of someone who was driving a car, and that could have led to an altercation. Don't look at me like that. Road rage murders are more common than you think. But the facts of the matter are that she got up in her house, alone, she had breakfast, then she got on a bus. It was the first thing she did. So, what would you want me to write? He had already scribbled something on a sheet of paper. He handed it to me. I read. At exactly seventeen minutes past eleven, Diana Jane Cooper exited from the number fourteen bus at the old Church Street H.J. stop and retraced her steps twenty-five metres along the pavement. She then entered Cornwallis and Sons' funeral parlour. I'm not writing that, I said. It reads like a police report. At least it's accurate. And what's the bell doing there? What bell? In the fourth paragraph, right here, you say there's a bell on a spring mechanism leading into the funeral parlour. Well, I didn't notice any bell, and that's because it's not there. I tried to stay calm. That was something I would soon learn about Hawthorne. When he put his mind to it, he could annoy me more easily than anyone I'd ever met. I put the bell in for atmosphere, I explained. You've got to allow me some sort of dramatic license. I wanted to show how traditional and old-fashioned the business was, Cornwallis and Sons, and that was a simple, effective way. Maybe, but it makes a big difference. Suppose someone followed her in there. Suppose someone overheard what she said. You're talking about the man she had the altercation with, I asked sarcastically. Or maybe someone she met at the bank. Is that what you think? Hawthorne shrugged. You're the one saying that there was a link between Mrs. Cooper arranging her funeral and her getting murdered the same day. At least, that's what you're suggesting to your readers. He lingered on the first syllable of readers, making it sound like a dirty word. But you have to consider the alternatives. Maybe the timing of the funeral and the murder was just a coincidence. Although I'll be honest with you, I don't like coincidences. I've been working in crime for twenty years, and I've always found everything has its place. Or maybe Mrs. Cooper knew she was going to die. She'd been threatened, and she arranged the funeral because she knew there was no way out. That's possible, but it doesn't make a lot of sense, because why didn't she just go to the police? And a third possibility, someone found out what she was doing. It could have been anyone. They could have followed her in off the street and listened to her making all the arrangements because there's no sodden bell on the door. Anyone could come in or go out without being heard, but not in your version. OK, I said, I'll take out the bell. And the Mont Blanc pen. Why? I stopped him before he could answer. All right, it doesn't matter. I'll lose that too. He pushed and prodded the pages as if trying to find a single sentence that he liked. You're being a bit selective with the information he said, at length. And what do you mean by that? Well, you say that Mrs. Cooper only used public transport, but you don't explain why. I say she was eccentric. I think you'll find there was rather more to it than that, May. And then there's the question of the funeral itself. You know exactly what she requested for a service, but you haven't written down what it was. A psalm? The Beatles? But which psalm? Which Beatles track? Don't you think it might be important? He took out a notebook and opened it. Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. The song was Eleanor Rigby. The poem was by someone called Sylvia Plath. Maybe you can help me with that one, Tony, because I read it and it didn't make a word of bleeding sense. The classical music was the trumpet voluntary by Jeremiah Clark. She wanted her son to give the main address. What do you call it? The eulogy. Whatever. And maybe you should have mentioned who she had lunch with at the Café Murano. His name is Raymond Clunes. He's a theatrical producer. Is he a suspect? Well, she'd just lost fifty grand in a musical he'd produced. From my experience, money and murder have a way of going hand in hand. Did I miss anything else? You don't think it's significant that Mrs. Cooper resigned from the board of the Globe Theatre that very same day? She's been doing it for six years, and the day she dies, she decides to give it all up. Then there's Andrea Klovanek, the cleaner. Where did you get that stuff about her tiptoeing out into the street and calling the emergency services? It came from her interview with the police. I read it too, but what makes you think she wasn't lying? Why would she be? I don't know, mate. But she's got a criminal record, so maybe she's not all sweetness and light. How do you know that? I checked. And finally there's Damien Cooper, the son. It might have been worth pointing out that he's just inherited two and a half million quid from his old mum, which is going to come in handy as I'm told he has money problems out there in L.A. 
I fell silent. There was a sinking feeling in my stomach. What money problems? I asked. From what I understand, most of them have gone up his nose. But there's the house in Hollywood Hills, the pool, the Porsche 911. He's got an English girlfriend who lives with him, but she can't be too fond of him either, because there's a load of other women knocking around. Knocking being the operative word. Is there anything in the chapter that was any good? I asked. Hawthorne thought for a moment. I like that gag about World's End, he said. I looked at the pages scattered in front of me. Maybe this is a bad idea, I said. Hawthorne smiled at me for the first time. When he smiled, that was when I saw the child he had once been. It was as if there was something inside him always struggling to be released, but it had got trapped inside the suit, the tie, the pale features, the malevolent gaze. Early days, mate. It's only a first chapter. You can tear it up and start again. The thing is, we've got to find a way of working together. A, um... He searched for the right phrase. A modus operandi, I suggested. He pointed a finger. You don't want to use posh words like that. You'll just get people's backs up. No, you just got to write what happens. We'll talk to the suspects. I'll make sure you have all the information. All you have to do is put it in the right order. And what happens if you don't solve it? I said. Maybe the police will find out who killed Diana Cooper before you do. He looked offended. They met her a load of tossers, he said. If they had a clue, they wouldn't have hired me. That's what I explained to you. A lot of murders are solved in the first 48 hours. Why? Because most murderers don't know what they're doing. They get angry. They lash out. It's spontaneous. And by the time they start thinking about blood spatter, car number plate, CCTV, it's too late. Some of them will try to cover their tracks, but with modern forensics, they haven't got a hope in hell. But then there are the tiny amount of murders, maybe only 2%, that are premeditated. They're planned. There might be a contract killing, or some nutter who's doing it for fun. The police always know. They know when they've got a sticker. And that's what they call this type of murder. And that's when they reach out to someone like me. They know they need help. So what I'm saying is, you have to trust me. If you want to add extra details, ask me first. Otherwise, just write down what you see. This isn't Tintin, OK? Wait a minute. Once again, Hawthorne had managed to throw me off balance. I never told you I was writing Tintin. You told me you were working for Spielberg, and that's what he's directing. He's producing. Anyway, what was it that made you change your mind about writing it? Was it your wife? I bet she told you what was good for you. Stop right there, I said. If we're going to have rules, the main rule is that you never ask me about my private life. Not my books, not my TV, not my family, not my friends. I'm interested you put them in that order. I'll write about you. I'll write about this case, and when you solve it, if you solve it, I'll see if I can get my publisher interested. But I am not going to be bullied by you. This is still my book, and I'm going to be the one who decides what goes into it. His eyes widened. Come down, Tony. I'm just trying to help. This is the agreement that we made. I wouldn't show Hawthorne any more of the book, certainly not while I was writing it, and probably not even after it was finished. I would write what I wanted to write, and if that meant criticising him or adding thoughts of my own, I would simply go ahead. But when it came to the scene of the crime, the interrogations or whatever, I would stick to the facts. I wouldn't imagine, extrapolate or embroider the text with potentially misleading descriptions. As for chapter one, forget the bell and the Mont Blanc pen. Diana Cooper had lunch with Raymond Clunes, and Andrea Kluvanek may not have been telling the truth. But be assured that the rest of it, including a clue which would indicate quite clearly the identity of the killer, is spot on. 4. Scene of the Crime There was a uniformed policeman standing outside Diana Cooper's home on the Monday morning when I presented myself there. A strip of that blue and white plastic tape, Police Line Do Not Cross, hung across the front door, but someone must have told him I was coming, because he let me in without even asking me my name. It was five days after the murder. Hawthorne had sent across copies of the police files and early interviews, which I had read over the weekend. He had attached a brief note, telling me to meet him here at nine. I stepped round a puddle in the short path that led to the front door, and went in. 
Normally, when I visit a crime scene, it's one that I have myself manufactured. I don't need to describe it. The director, the locations manager, the designer, and the props department will have done most of the work for me.